Illinois. Ebert country. Yeah. Uh, well, so supposedly I kind of combined, I don't know if you've picked up on this, but I combined two different things, components that are happening at the moment. And one was this uh, Chris Marker uh, retrospective on the Sundance Now Doc Club yeah. series, uh, which which uh, Museum Hours is included. And then also the fact that your some a couple of your films are on now on Fandor's website. Mm-hmm. So with these two things happening and converging, this was the opportunity to sit down and talk. Not that I need uh, you were always on my mind anyway. So <laughs> I'm not going to break into song, but like a Willie, yeah, Willie, <laughs> a Willie fan. That's right. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go back a little bit for for my own um, benefit, if you don't mind. Um, I was just curious where you where you grew up. I grew up in Washington, D.C. primarily. I moved around a lot when I was a kid. I was born in Afghanistan because right. my father was uh, working for USAID and Columbia University. And then I lived a couple of years in Brazil when I was four and five. But mostly I grew up in the D.C. area. Yeah. You see, so you probably don't have any memories of the Afghanistan section, though it makes for an interesting origin. It's probably somewhere in my sub conscious right color palette but i can't say that i remember it yeah that's an interesting th- thought though that it, it's it's part of your uh identity in some some manner even though you may not be able to tap into it memory wise yeah but it's there isn't it well it's there and it's also it's an odd thing because afghanistan was sort of complete everyone was completely oblivious to it here for first 35 years or so of my life and then suddenly everybody knew all, all too well you know what Afghanistan was for all the wrong reasons so it's uh it has taken on a political complexity that's deeply tragic and uh you know it's on my passport so it probably uh wow. do you feel somewhat defensive for Afghanistan at the time you know, when, well, I when, feel when defensive for any country that uh, gets steamrolled by criminal political intention. I mean, you know, Afghanistan had also been steamrolled by mm. the Soviet Union, but it was um, completely re- repulsive to know that my own government was was using Afghanistan as a kind of... Uh, Smoke screen of sorts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have you been back? No, I've never been there, and and I I don't know that 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 would be viable, <laughs> <laughs> or the wisest uh, decision. But I would at the love moment, to have, but, yeah. have seen it in my adult life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you said, uh, then you for a while were in Brazil, just for a couple of years when I was four years old. Uh-huh. But you know, my family traveled a lot, and I think that's a big part of who I am. I travel a lot uh, when I can. Your dad was a bureaucrat? That's such he, a negative no, he word. he was in education. My dad was helping to set up schools. Oh, very good. And then became a an editor of a journal of early childhood education, and my mom wrote children's books. So, and they were both very in, interested in the arts. My dad painted, and we were taken to museums all around the world. Mm-hmm. You ended up a filmmaker and a photographer, artist. It was it sort of all naturally sort of this curiosity uh, to experiment in different mediums in order, you know, just as a natural thing, but maybe never settled into one proper, like, uh, you, you consider yourself an artist, I suppose, as opposed to a filmmaker. Well, I've usually referred to myself as a filmmaker just because somehow it sounds a little less pretentious than to say I am an artist, but I, I don't really distinguish between... Mm-hmm media and formats and those photography and film are are both are kind of two sides of the photographic coin Mm -hmm. so it's all stuff that i like to do and some of it is dictated by necessity you know it's a lot cheaper to take a still than make a movie but um but you can I reach, love it all, yeah. I'm sorry, Deidre. But you can reach a lot of people through film, too, which is 
a nice yeah. benefit of that, right? But I was going to get back to growing up in Washington. And then I was wondering where the fascination or the urge to become a filmmaker was, but it's a little bit different with your case because maybe you were experimenting in, in, in other disciplines first. Well, I wasn't so much, but all of my friends were. My my friends in D.C. when I was in high school, um, many of them, many of my closest friends became musicians in the in the punk rock moment that that hit DC pretty hard and that was a tremendous influence on me but I I just wasn't musically inclined so I, I was taking or my, you know some of my earliest stills at the time but even so I wasn't really I hadn't set out to to document the scene or anything I was really mostly going to shows because I wanted to be there and and hear the music but I you know I it was a template it was an extraordinary education in what is now often called DIY so that ended up playing a big part just in terms of it being an example of creating things outside of an industry which had no interest in you and in which uh, which you know the music industry for them eventually the film industry for me had little to do with what we were actually interested in you ended up in um, going to that hotbed of conservative thinking and <laughs> Wesleyan <laughs> University well when I went ironically. to Wesleyan um, there was a a film department that had an extraordinary focus on more or less classical Mm -hmm. Hollywood cinema and some very good teaching along those lines, but there was virtually no documentary and certainly no experimental film. Uh, You know, I took a class in sort of on the periphery of the, there wasn't even a film department when I was there. Per, per, I mean, there was a film Technical. department, mm-hmm. but there was no film major. Let me correct that. Right. So uh, I took a class in in German cinema. That was interesting. And I got a very in-depth look at Hitchcock and, and Westerns and folks like Otto Preminger, but... I also worked at the film series there, which was quite intensive, and and that was a bit of a real re- revelation. We, mm-hmm. we we you know we we booked films like uh, Jean Vigo films that became much more influential for me than than the Hollywood stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, it's pretty amazing because I mean, how would you have I guess you discovered these types of filmmakers in college, right? Because, I mean, you, it, how would you have had the exposure up to that point? I guess you were talking about the early to mid-80s now, right? Yeah. So this was pre-internet, and, and right. um, I had not had much exposure. Uh, I mean, I mean, even like almost the nine, renting a VHS really. was about 10 years old at that point. And, yeah, um, nobody, nobody I knew did that in college. I mean, nobody right. had a VHS. No in their own dorm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I learned a lot by reading about things in the art library and coming across references to films and stills from them. But it, it was really, um, and, and in, in art history, we, we, we saw things like in Shannon de Lou, but, um, it wasn't until a good deal later on that I really, became aware of the tradition that that I'm now more part of or comfortable with mm. but I also I mean it was it was a thrill we were there were, it was a time when there were even there were I think four major Hitchcock films that were entirely unavailable on that and and they it's screened them in, in 35 millimeter yeah. so I mean I think I saw vertigo in 35 when vertigo was entirely un, 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 unavailable and then it's interesting that that became but that's such a pivotal film for Chris Marker and and other people, and and so. Thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so right. I I don't. That's very true. I don't. I never really, you know, 
bought the kind of strict dichotomy between experimental film and and uh, narrative film or Hollywood film. I think that there's a lot of blurred boundaries there. But it is quite true that I I wasn't the focus was not on blurred boundaries in my education and then that became kind of my own interest and in discovery and yeah, yeah. obsession uh, so hence you're, you're ultimately I guess you're being put in this category of being influenced by Chris Marker <laughs> is the well, is you're writing that kind of tension also between or as you put it the blurry area between uh, tr- conventional narrative storytelling and what we call what we call everything else, which is experimental. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I saw any marker while I was in college. I may have seen La Jete. I, I certainly didn't see Sans Soleil until mm-hmm. many years later. I left school to make my f- my own first film. I, I worked for. Um, a small company, a, a husband and wife that made industrials mm-hmm. in Florida about childbirth and firefighting, and they were they had I had known them. Not when the I same was, movie, ostensibly, right? They, we're talking about yeah, separate <laughs> separate sides of the family business, but it was uh-huh. it, it, they were they were very self sufficient and very very um, good at 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 working small, and I worked for them as a shipping clerk so that I could use their gear on my off hours and they had a bowl U R16 which also interestingly is the camera that Marker shot Saint Soleil with so wow. but but at the time I was cobbling together making a film on my own because I didn't know anybody I didn't have a crew I was in Florida working as a shipping clerk and I and I had to make a thesis film out of what was at hand and so my first film is a experimental narrative hybrid and it wasn't i think if i was influenced by anything it it, it certainly may have been jean vigo mm-hmm. um but really it was practical discovery by just stumbling into what i what i could do you know and what somehow interested me it didn't occur to me to to have to have a template for it it just felt natural Mm -hmm. well i could see around this time did you take off any time before school or did you go because i'm kind of kind of guess that you graduated around 84 85 i graduated 84 84. yeah four okay so would you, then you went down to Florida because the, this job opportunity, or did you go down? You were well, traveling a little bit, and well, they didn't have much filmmaking at Wesleyan at all, and I right. wanted to make films, you know. And so, and you weren't in Washington I, anymore. Now you were kind of free to. Be my family you were. had moved uh, to the Boston area by the time I finished college, but basically, mm-hmm. there was very little production at Wesleyan. There was very little in the way of gear, and. It just wasn't an environment that was that conducive to making sure. odd movies. Mm-hmm. And so I and I also was running out of money and my financial aid was in peril. So I I took off and did a work working semester and made my thesis and graduated early in in essence. This was uh, but this was undergraduate. This was undergraduate. I never okay, went to grad okay. school. Oh, okay. I never went to film school. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. I think it was in 84 where they re-released. the. Finally, they were able to theatrically release uh, Vertigo. That could well be. Because I was living in Boston, and I remember going to the Brattle, and they were playing The Trouble with Harry. Uh, I think it was the, is it The Trouble with Harry? or You know, he's the one where... Yeah, he's a, I, a corpse. I don't remember which the ones, but it was Vertigo was one of them. Yeah, and I believe Rear Window was another one. Uh, and they had been in co- uh, some legal yeah. morass where you could not; they weren't playing. You know, you couldn't see them in a the theater for. Uh, anyway, it was. I remember it was that that period when they were came out again. Just just uh, happens to be at that that time when you were graduating and uh, became a, becoming a shipping clerk in Florida. But you made your first film, which uh, you were talking about. And yeah, then, a sixteen millimeter film called A Road in Florida that I did in eighty three and then I graduated in eighty four. Okay. 
Oh, and that, that also doubled as your, as you said, your your thesis project. Yeah, I did a photography thesis as well. I was a studio what at the time. It was a studio art major because they didn't officially have the film major. So I was a studio art right. major with a concentration in film and photography, and I did a double thesis. Mm-hmm. So after that, after I, I assume you didn't stay in Florida terribly long. No. <laughs> Um, and we appreciate we appreciate that. Uh, no, no, no offense to Florida. It's just um, also maybe not the greatest place to pursue what you were probably starting to figure out was what you would like to pursue. Yeah, I, I, I had no. It was a, it was a working situation for a semester, and then I, I came to New York and and just had to make a go of it. And it still very much. Uh, I would ma- imagine caught up in the uh, punk and maybe the music coming out of that period. Yeah, I was um, I was obsessed with it. So a lot of a lot of visits to clubs, uh, CBGBs, or spots like that. Yeah, there were plenty of them at the time, weren't there? Yeah, there were. Not so much anymore, but at least those are not there anymore. There may be plenty of clubs, but yeah. the ones that were there at the time were kind of all pretty much gone at this stage. Yeah, almost all. Webster Hall is, a, was, is still operating. It used to be mm-hmm. the Ritz. Right. Oh, right. I think. Yeah, yeah. And so you started making, uh, uh, did you, you continue making experimental films? We'll, we'll just Well, I didn't c- consider them experimental, but right. if that's what other people wanted to call them, there wasn't too much I could do about it. I was just <laughs> making films. Understood. Yeah, I didn't, I, I'm still just making films. I don't know what what they are. You know, I don't. It doesn't seem all that important to me to figure out what they're, what what box they're supposed to fit in. Gotcha. You know? What that's not okay. That's fair enough. And I'm just, where do you get most of your? Um, this is kind of a two 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 part question, I guess. Uh, where did you get? Uh, it sounds like music was an early influence, and I know you may ended up collaborating with a number of musicians and uh, bands, and uh, which we'd also classify, you know, quick, if one had to reduce to bands with art, more of an artsy side to them. Uh, it, yeah, I, no, I wasn't. I mean, really, I, that, that I wish that I had been of, that open-minded back in those times. Maybe but they were mostly more when of, I was in high commercial bands coming out of that period. When I was in high school, I was, I was listening to the Ramones, you know, I mean, I was as excited by the Ramones as, as any other music. And, Mm -hmm. and so, and then, you know, I grew, I went to high school with Ian Mackay to public school in DC. And while I was in high school, you know, he he formed teen idols. And then, uh, eventually when I went to college, he was in minor threat and then Fugazi. So, uh, I was intimately aligned with some of those musicians but again i don't think that any of us were really concerned about genre you know we were just, yeah sure well this is a just, commercial thing that that's imposed anyway i suppose right yeah so, it's inevitable so, it's not yeah. the end of the world but no. it, anyway yeah um so anyway you weren't obviously going into it either as a video you know quote unquote video rock video music video uh director you were coming from a different perspective also there were more for you as far as you were concerned collaborations it wasn't like you were going to get some this wasn't the idea wasn't to get your a video onto mtv which was in its birth too actually at the point which maybe you could have because they were probably hungry for these type this type of content but uh, well, MTV seemed to be an interesting possibility for about five minutes, and then it became very corrupt very quickly, and it basically became a form of industry advertising in which I I had very little interest. There was a brief window where they were so hungry to fill up their hours that they would show sort of odd and interesting things on occasion, mm-hmm. but it it was also... I just it, it became you know pretty rep- repulsive, pretty like extremely sexist and extremely slick and and commercialized, and I, I didn't I didn't want to do that. But I did make it, about a dozen of them, generally in situations where I had a great deal of control and I could kind of go off and make a short film and 
if someone wanted to call it a music video, that was that was Again, fine with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't really fine with me, but it but it meant that I uh, could get paid, and that was a way of sustaining myself. So I, I ended up, you know, working for REM very early on, and and that was uh, that was really helpful and and quite interesting for a while. So I did about a dozen. A couple of them were. But mostly I worked with, you know, Fugazi who had no interest whatsoever in making a music video proper. And uh, we got into other territory combining what they did and what I did. Mm -hmm. But we were thinking of it, if anything, as a kind of anti-music video approach. And this was instrument? No, first it was a piece called Glue Man. Um, It was a song that I was involved in and actually writing some of the lyrics and they did, you know, they, they were inspired to write the song because they came and I visit me in New York and I had some super eight footage that I showed them, just projected it on the wall and, and we ended up kind of going back and forth and the song came out of a sort of shared experience. And, and then we, I did a film and that song was on their first record and that's sort of established a working relationship that ended up continuing for, quite a long time with the 10 year arc of making instrument. So I was working, you know, I was very involved in music and and working with bands, but they were generally very collaborative, independent projects in which either there was no label involved, no, no commercial label or major label, or even if there was a label, it was a uh, an unusual circumstance where I was given a lot of freedom. And when that, you know, became less and less possible, I got more and more out. Out is pushed out, or, or well, I rather stepped out. Just stepped I out. just didn't want yeah. to be a music video director, mm-hmm. and I didn't like being referred to as one because it was. I just, you know, most of MTV was a drag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I hear that. Uh, the well, Fugazi was uh, based again where. They were they were very much a DC band. Yeah, they always. Were, okay. Yeah. Did so? Did you know those guys before? Just from from when you were in high school and that. that I period? went to high school with Ian Mackay. Who, oh, we, you and, did say that. Okay. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. uh, the other guys I got to know from the moment that they were forming that that band. Mm-hmm. What was that? I guess I knew Brendan too a little bit, but um, yeah, it was great. You know, to to witness the the beginnings of that and see them learning well, and mm-hmm. changing and navigating and something clicking with people and seeing that happen, that connection that they had with their audiences. And uh, I assume, and yeah, but it was also, it was just a very different template. I mean, Fugazi toured without regard to whether they were trying to push a record at the time. It wasn't the vehicle that it was performing and it was growing as a band. Uh, artistically it wasn't about selling records yeah and again as i said before you know that all impressed me as a kind of template that you just made stuff to make it and you tried to push yourself in order to push yourself but it wasn't it wasn't really you weren't it wasn't towards some goal of a career or getting into some film festival or selling your work to television Mm -hmm. just what people did uh it was uh and I assume that, you know, you were also exposed to more and more uh, European filmmakers and, you know, different types of film through this period as well. Uh, as yeah. that became more re- available and... Yeah, well, I, I had seen a lot, of, a lot of great cinema in college through the film series in particular. And, and so I was certainly... Were you cur- but I w- curating that? I, was, I worked for the film series, so I had a, a hand yeah. in being able to request certain films and uh you know i remember seeing an amazing hungarian film called time stand still and i remember but i also you know i i loved raging bull you know i mean i i i loved a lot of things i didn't really i wasn't Mm -hmm. making a distinction like oh i'm interested in european art films and therefore not in this i I didn't feel that way at all i guess i was more more just trying to draw a connection between your feelings about your career and and what was probably more prevalent in in europe than here in the states where scorsese for instance uh made a handful of of films and kind of quickly became a major hollywood 
or major studio filmmaker uh, as opposed to and you know is making much more commercial things with big Hollywood names at this stage you know you know but not criticizing uh, it's just that there seems to be very few filmmakers and, and artists in the states that are, can pursue a non commercially driven career whereas in Europe it feels as though and I could be wrong but it feels as though and it's a very <laughs> big continent with lots of countries and cultures within so it's a generalization to say that you could uh, have a career like a chris marker who yeah never made i mean a commercial film in his life that you know? is that's very true i think that it's fair to say that europe had a somewhat more supportive tendency towards the arts in general and they're less embarrassed about it whereas in america it's always been you know we kind of push our poetry and our experimental stuff to the margins but you know we still had Cassavetes and he was an enormous uh power to me you know I mean he it, I I felt like the the power of Cassavetes was in its way and you know a homegrown American thing I didn't think of it as like a European thing mm -hmm. so but I also you know I I I got work in the film business in order to support myself. And I, so I was kind of seeing both ends of the spectrum. I was going to anthology film archives and collective for living cinema and seeing at that point, starting to see very personal and experimental and avant-garde work and more, more and more documentary work. But it, it also, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about a career. I was thinking of making a movie and then making another movie and then I had an idea for another movie and it never really occurred to me to think about it in terms of like a career you know? right okay but you but also you had people you you were trying to get people to see, see the films no I mean that was always kind of secondary or uh -huh. you know beyond secondary sure I wanted people to see the work but well how did you how did you throughout the late eighties into the through the nineties? How were you? How were you doing that? Were you working within a, a community? Was there a community of of artists and filmmakers that you circulated within and that were kind of helped it created a kind of a distribution in a way or exhibition for what you were doing? To be really honest, mm -hmm. I didn't really feel that I was part of a community very much. I felt there was a community. And I'm very thankful that they existed, but they, they, it tended to be a much harder dichotomy between experimental or so-called avant-garde work and other, or, you know, and, and I was, I wasn't really comfortable with that and they weren't really that comfortable or welcoming with my work early on. There, there were certain entities that were, there were a few f film festivals. I eventually connected with the video data bank in Chicago, and that was a way of distri distributing work mostly to universities and media centers and little museums and things, mm -hmm. um, certainly not to movie theaters. Um, and I just did my thing. It was very independent, and I was mostly working as a kind of one-man band and making the movies, shooting them, editing them, putting together the soundtracks. For quite for a, a while, it was, it really, it didn't have a lot to do with a scene or, you know, there was like a Lower East Side thing that people talked about cinema of transgression. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. It seemed, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of, mm -hmm. kind of dumb, you know, but there were places to go see interesting work here. And I would go to anthology and watch Russian silent films and go up to, you know, Lincoln Center when they had a Cassavetes retrospective and, and, so I was kind of soaking things in, but mostly I was walking around shooting. And a lot of that came out of a, a street photography tradition that I was very mm. familiar with that mm -hmm. had little to do with, you know, what we're taught about filmmaking, even though it's very crucial to filmmaking. So people like, you know, Walker Evans and Ache, and then eventually, uh, you know, Helen Levitt and Robert Frank and those people were immensely important to me. Uh, Ed, did you ever get to, uh, I don't know, meet any of these, of your, of these? Uh... Yeah, I know, I know uh, 
Robert Frank a, a little bit and, and I've been very thankful to have made his acquaintance and I'm I'm, I'm a closer to his wife June Leaf who's one of my favorite artists very important to me mm -hmm. what inspired Museum Hours um, when when did you start on, on that project well Museum Hours was inspired by the life I'd lived up until I made it mm -hmm. I mean it really was because I, as I mentioned I was taken to a lot of museums when I was a kid which Mm -hmm. I didn't always appreciate, but it it's sunk in. And I had a very fine art history teacher in at Wesleyan, and and that that was a very important to me. Looking at paintings and looking at at art from the all the way from the deep past to you know people like Robert Smithson, who mm -hmm. kind of blew my mind, and 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 so all of these things were influences but museum hours it mostly just came out of my own experience of being in this particular museum and looking at particular paintings by Peter Bruegel the Elder and feeling a kind of kinship and a lot of it had to do with documentary as an idea as a as an experience and so I felt like I wanted to somehow take that on in the in a, in a film and it I got the idea to use a museum guard as a kind of way to get at certain ideas because it was a, a very down-to-earth character, a very down-to-earth situation that I could use in order to explore some wider territory. Mm -hmm. So it just came very naturally to me, except that you know the scale had to be a little bigger than I usually work in. As far as making a, a fiction narrative. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do dialogue, then being a one-man band isn't necessarily such a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a good sand ma sound man. It's nice to have, yeah, you know, somebody else to share the cinematography with, so that I could, if I, you know, I I worked with a with a co DP, and because I felt like if I wanted to put my camera down and just focus on the actors. I, I had that option, but I ended up shooting a lot of the film because I love to shoot. And you had very good actors who kind or, of or very good it. people. Yeah. One of whom was not an actor at all. Mm -hmm. Non-actor. Um, yeah, they were the great. The guard is, what, I'm sorry, what was the character's name again? Um, Bobby Summer played, uh, Johan, yeah. the museum guard, and mm -hmm. he was not an actor. Right. Was, um, he's it's a it's a it's an amazing performance to get out of a non actor. You don't see that as too frequently. Well, I mean, I just saw, for instance, um, this. Uh, do you know David Gordon Green? Mm -hmm. uh, I just had seen this film Joe with Nick Cage, but yeah. one of the characters is this actor who they found. Yeah, I haven't. I'm looking forward to seeing that. I mean, I'm not going to give away anything. No, no. D David told me about that guy. I mean, we. I, um, and I, I, yeah, I, I hear he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, let's face it. You're talking about the phenomena of it being kind of unusual to see a great non-actor to get a great role from a non a performance from a non-actor. But that's not about you, what you're talking about is the fact that people finance their movies because of the stars that they can pull into them. It has nothing to do with with what's good for cinema or what's good in cinema because True, right. many of the greatest performances I've ever seen were not only by non-actors but they're more powerful because you're not, you're not aware mm -hmm. you're not distracted exactly the distraction factor to me is absolutely immense I mean I can be watching a movie and sometimes I'm thinking you know Oh, Sean Penn's doing a great job, but I'm thinking about Sean Penn doing a great job. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about his other roles and I'm thinking about, you know, what he had to do to prepare. And all of that takes me out of mm -hmm. the moment. It mm -hmm. takes me out of the movie. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, when you're watching 12 Years a Slave and all of a sudden Brad Pitt shows up in the role, you're, you're thrown out of it. Uh, yeah, I felt the same but... way with, you know, Thin Red Line, which I liked a great deal, but I, it mm -hmm. pained me to think that, you know, mm -hmm. at the time he probably had to finance the film by 
right packing it with right also if you if somebody like with a lot of money like brad pitt who was also a rainmaker can is your signs on as ep you're going to give him a role you know sure but, uh, but actually you know it's funny because i wasn't really even thinking about that with your films but but it's it's ironic that a lot of people go for that very reason to a movie to see their favorite to see the sean penn they're not going because uh yeah, you absolutely. know they're going to see a guard talk about Right. Describe art to a, you know, a child or something. That's understandable and it can be wonderful. I mean, I'll go to a movie to see Humphrey Bogart, you know. I I don't go to a movie to see Tom Hanks, but I I you know, I love to see Marlena Dietrich, you know, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a there's a place for all of this. But there's nothing like the feeling of seeing an early Kiarostami film in which you really have no idea whether people are even performing per se <laughs> right. sometimes, True. you know, and then yeah. it's become, can become very interesting to find out that indeed they, they were, but nonetheless, it's just, it's really a crying shame that the, that celebrity drives cinema to the degree that it does. And I think it, I think movies suffer for it except in the rare occasion where they don't, where their performance is so special. You know, I, I, I go on like this, but then the other day I was, you know, sitting in a hotel room and one of the Godfather movies came on and, you know, it's, a, it's, an ex, it's extraordinary. And I didn't mind that it's... Marlon Brando. Well, it wasn't, yeah, you know, I was thinking of some of the smaller character actors in the movie who are really really amazing but you know i'm still aware that they're actors and so i'm i'm not it's not a one or the other proposition there just ought to be a lot more room for doing what's really right for your movie and for museum hours i would not i would have destroyed my movie if i had put known actors in it i mean mary margaret o'hara has done some acting and she's an extraordinary singer and people some people knew her in advance as a performer and in the case of the film chain you know miho nikaido had done some acting before she's been in you know hal hartley's films and but mira bilotti had 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 not been an actor before and so but in both cases they weren't so well known that the celebrity factor would be a distraction and from the film. And so, Oops, of course, yeah. Anyway, I, ambient, I feel like I'm ambient, giving you a lot of ramble for your buck. Oh, um, no, 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 no. Because, uh, first of all, the people that are going to listen to a, uh, a an extensive conversation with someone, um, you know, they're sort of interested in... They like the ramble. All right. The, yeah, the ramble is, is the very uh, thing they're looking for. <laughs> All right. Well, let me know if they're it gets a little too. I, of course, uh, but um, it, museum hours. We were saying museum hours is, 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 had some success in the festivals uh, in the festival circuit a couple of summers ago. It ended or years ago. It ended up in Bam Cinema Fest. Yeah, I mean, it, I, it had that's actually, where I saw it. It premiered at Locarno in 2012 okay, in the summer. Okay. Then the first, the North American premiere was Toronto. Mm-hmm. And so that was in the uh, f- that Toronto's in September October of 2012. So then it came to BAM last year. Then 2013, yeah, I think so. Okay, so okay, and so it, the theatrical opening uh-huh. was in the spring of 2013. And is that right? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, if it then it couldn't have been BAM <laughs> Cinema Fest last summer because well, it played. It Let's just say it, would, the it was there. Uh, I don't know. They happen around the same time. Okay. So suffice to say, yes, to everybody's amazement, mm-hmm. the film not only had a nice festival life, but it actually did really well in theaters. Mm. Yeah, and, it got some great reviews, I remember. Uh, how does that feel to you, though? Is it almost rub against what you No. <laughs> no, I'm sure it's satisfying. But uh, it doesn't. It's fa- it's fabulous. You're it's, a sellout, finally. No, it's great. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do anything. I didn't change anything to make that happen. And I just happened to have distributors, mm-hmm. Cinema Guild, who took it on fearlessly without any sense of diminished expectation or, you know, they didn't go into it saying like, oh yeah, this is one of those weird, hard to pin down 
art films without known actors. So therefore, let's just assume that no one's going to see it. They they went in saying, oh, we love this movie. We think it really connects to people. Let's let's do it. Let's go for it. They did. And I very, I'm very thankful. I'm thankful that they took it on with that attitude, but I'm also thankful that that there are some distributors who actually only take on movies that they love and feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. And some of those movies are in theory impossible marketing wise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would think that cinema guild does do that. They found their niche and uh, that's why it's like Dan Salit is his latest film was, I think uh, picked up uh, Terrence Nance, uh, his film was picked up by the Cinema Guild, I believe. Right. Well, they did. They also did Leviathan and mm-hmm. Monocamina and and you know Bellatar films. And but I don't think they just find a niche. I think that they make a niche because okay, people fair. go to a movie and they're like, "Wow, I've never seen anything like this before." I'm going to keep an eye out for what they bring out next because people are actually sometimes surprisingly hungry for things that they haven't seen before and that might in some way open their mind or blow their mind or freak them out and the more that we assume that that isn't the case the more it it's a self-fulfilling prophecy right sure sure and so we you know we are in a time where there's this extraordinary weight of blockbusters and stars and everybody getting all freaked out every goddamn time about the Academy Awards or Sundance or whatever. And it's just important to be reminded that there's a whole other universe where people just make interesting, unusual things. And I see them all the time at film festivals in particular well certainly ones like Locarno and- or the Viennale you know mm-hmm. which is really kind of my favorite and they were very supportive to me, to me mm-hmm. over the years so you know this stuff happens it's just important to recognize it so that it continues to happen it, well another sign of this I, it is uh, Vandor is curating films like we're talking about they have uh Uh, museum hours and instrument on their site so obviously people are are going are interested in subscribing so they may not be they may see it in this way but i don't know how somebody from you know who lives in outside indianapolis would see it otherwise uh well i mean for one thing cinema guild actually got it into the little theaters in the middle of nowhere i mean it Mm -hmm. played in like you know wilton new hampshire which Mm -hmm. like blew my mind you know and so did you go to wilton i didn't go i you know my i've got my my elderly parents are not well so i'm traveling very mm-hmm. little and i i didn't go to most of the festivals that the film played in but it did you know it it popped up in a lot of very unusual mm-hmm. places and sometimes it actually it did just fine and as i said before it's not because i changed my filmmaking no, no, to right. make something yeah. more accessible or commercial or anything like that. I didn't at all, really. But I also think that the movie is pretty down to earth and it's kind of funny sometimes. And, you know, people, it it doesn't necessarily feel like I didn't want to make a pretentious art film, but I've never wanted to make pretentious art films. Most of the work that I do is pretty straight up. Mm -hmm. It's just not necessarily that easy to identify like what the films are and that throws some people off but it also intrigues some people and that's i'm not inventing some something new or 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 it's a tradition it's a path that goes back to very early cinema for people to do personal films and uh cross genre films and you know films where they're discovering what they need to make by making it. That's what Siga Vertov did and mm-hmm. and that's what, you know, Joris Evans did and I think it's what Kiarostami did. It's a 
Agnes Varda, you know, there's plenty of people, Chantal Ackerman, who uh, just did their thing. They weren't, I don't think there, any of those people were trying to fit in or, or, or declare that they were the first or, I just think that that's what, that's what they're, that's what they're here for. Doing a job. Yeah. Well, Sundance Now is doing a month long retrospective of Chris Marker work, which is not always easy to find. Right. Um, and they're also including a few films that are about Chris Marker or by other filmmakers who are ostensibly f- influenced. So yeah. the film, which will be nice for people, will potentially discover uh, museum hours. Yeah. I mean, I. Through this I'm, Sundance Now ch- website. Yeah. I mean, Chris Marker, I don't even know where to start about Chris Marker because he is um, such a wonderful presence in the history of of cinema, but also in the history of of the hybrid of the essay film of basically crossing back and forth between boundaries and countries and time zones without a great deal of deference to uh, to commercial viability or popularity. And, you know, he's seen as this very kind of mysterious proposition, but he was actually very generous to other filmmakers. He was very, he was very kind to me. He was very kind to other filmmakers that I've known, many of whom are kind of working off the beaten path. And, he also, you know, maintained a remarkable political engagement that was very complicated, but very passionate. And I'm, I'm thankful. It was, it was great to have him in the world, and now it's great to have him in the world in his work. So... I dedicated my earlier film, Chain, directly to Chris Marker and another filmmaker, Humphrey Jennings. Museum Hours has a kind of hidden dedication. I didn't feel like I needed to do it that twice in you know, subsequent feature films, but there's a little initial at the end of the thanks, KMS, which is Krasna Sandor, the name that mm-hmm. he used as the sort of cameraman character in San Soleil and and in other parts of his career. So I'm, it's, Marker was so important to me that I'm happy to tip my hat to him many times. And I'm, I've been, you know, working on a series of shorts that are somewhat in homage to him. Maybe they'll even, fall together in a longer form thing I don't I don't know but you know here's to Chris Marker wherever he may roam it was an opportunity for me to watch I, I don't remember the last time I saw Sans Soleil but I watched it again uh, the other day yeah I mean you can watch it any number of times if yeah. there ever was a cliche that's true in this case I don't think that Sans Soleil, you know, ever becomes redundant because it's very, very complex and very rich. And everybody who sees it will have their own experience, which is not something that you can say about a lot of films that are made. A lot of films are basically the ideas that everybody should have a pretty similar experience. Mm-hmm. Which can be connective and, and okay, uh, I guess. But this is, it's nice to have the contrast. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's connective and okay until it's limiting and and uh, insulting to the intelligence <laughs> of the viewer. Sure. You know, yeah. Which is often the case in in some of the most popular movies. And that's how you you. I suppose figure out how to get it to the most people's in front of most people's eyes is to 
you know, dumb it down to the, and I should say that, but to well, you should, make it the why, most successful why shouldn't, why shouldn't you say by getting well, the each complication. Why shouldn't you say that? Uh, because there are a lot of people that are smart that, that do look forward to f- tuning out when it comes to certain types of media. Um, I don't, you know, what can I, t- I don't know. It's like uh, the people maybe f- uh, that you hear are find that they like to be uh, maybe um, challenged uh, artistically or just uh, stimulated in that way. And when it comes to going to the movies, they're looking for Tom Hanks, you know. And Yeah, I mean, I don't think that those things necessarily have to be again so so separable i mean Mm -hmm. you know i love to see a marx brothers movie Mm -hmm. and that can be fantastic to be in a theater and there's a whole bunch of people laughing at a marx brothers movie Mm -hmm. but really the marx brothers movie is anarchy and it's full of surprise and insanity and if you were to take some of the jokes in a marx brothers movie and throw them at a focus group some people would just be befuddled or they'd say like, well, that's too weird or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not. So why think of like a popular comedy, like for example, a Marx Brothers or a Charlie Chaplin or a Buster Keaton and think of it in terms that those movies have nothing to do with being dumbed down. And they also have nothing to do with a focus group mentality, which tells their filmmakers you have to end your movie this way because that's the only way it's going to sell. You know, we have to make room for every kind of movie, including movies that I don't necessarily, you know, care for, but I can still, they can still be a lot freer than movies often are. And, I just think it's interesting that you were like using these these words. You know, you were mm-hmm. saying like dumb down or or you were saying, um, mm-hmm. you know, that people want to go and, and, and tune out. Escapism, you know, obviously that's. I am one totally. Can, I, I, one can enjoy. When I, one when can I, have escapes. Right. I know. When I go see Chris mean, Marker sans mm-hmm. soleil, I'm. I'm escaping all mm-hmm. over the place. Mm-hmm. I'm escaping. We're having a conversation about it at the, you know, the the typical conversation. Uh, going back to when I said it's something people like some commercial stuff sometimes because it does kind of, you know, we do experience it together, uh, which is not requiring much from us. We just sort of sit and have, you know, this inform- this sort of this stimulation coming to or to us. And then we can kind of laugh at the at the line at you know the mo- certain moments which we're told or the f- kind of indicated that are these moments, but we do there is something that's shared through there on some level is all I was saying. And uh, but you're right. Uh, I I think when it comes to a Marx Brothers or a Charlie Chaplin film, for instance, you can certainly just just enjoy it on the surface level, and sh- and and still kind of be elevated somehow. Which you don't necessarily get a lot from some of the Avenger sequels. <laughs> yeah, I miss those, so I, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't know. I mean, every once in a while, there's a surprise there, too. But mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is, it's just that it's up to us not to let one thing be the only thing and be so dominant that the other stuff doesn't even have a shot. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. by all rights, yeah. people could have looked at museum hours and some of them did you know and 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 they just immediately write it off Dismiss it. and assume that you know mm-hmm. well people aren't going to go for this but the fact is people out there you know in new hampshire or the middle of the midwest or other places where there aren't necessarily a lot of quote unquote art films Apparently, there was something that they were hungry for in that film. And, you know, I've seen it many times that people think that they understand this industry. They think they know. And then you have, like, you know, Kelly Reichert makes Old Joy. And, uh, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. why would that movie do okay? Because... It's an interesting, beautifully shot film. Mm-hmm. That's why. You know, let the people 
make their own let make the, up their own minds up. Let the people make make their own minds up. Um, but they can only make their own minds up if they can access the films and if people see it in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, I was just going to say, um, this my filmmaker friend Orner Tukal, who I'm sure you've you've met. I He's, don't know that I know okay. Him. Anyway, but he he sort of said he, we I did a live podcast thing not long ago. And he was like uh, remarking on that Manola Dargis article about there's too many right. kind of mediocre independent films and they shouldn't be distributed and we, there's too much of a flood of film. And it's interesting, A, that, that we're looking at those films as being the problem right. where as opposed to, you know, if you're opening a film like, you know, and again, it's just arbitrary, but if you're opening up Spider-Man 2 at 4,000 screens, give up 5,000 of those, oh, I'm sorry, 500 of those screens. Maybe five thousand of them. But give up five hundred of those screens and put in old joys of the world and museum hours of the world and see how these films do. Um they don't have a shot. You know? But the other thing is is that So again, uh, we're glad for Sundance yeah. now in Fandor in the meantime. But yeah, you know. but the other thing is that it could it could also have happened that Museum Hours would come out and very few people would see it. All right. The question then to me is of those few people, you know, maybe some of them were really deeply affected. So it's really, it's nice to me that the movie found some success and sur- surprising degree of of it. Mm-hmm. But that's not really that, It's that's not really what it's about either. It's It's about something... You know, you were talking about Chris Marker movies and that they were difficult to see. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, when people did see them and when people sought them out, they had their minds blown. Sometimes they had their lives changed or they were... A universe of possibility was opened up to them in a way that it seldom is with a film. And Marker put all of his energy into making the next thing and very, very, very little energy into selling the previous thing. And that's okay too. Well, right. Because then you're, 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 you're as a film, as a, you're no longer a filmmaker. You're now a distributor working on getting people into seats and not, making films exactly and, and which, that is the expectation now now that now everybody yeah, well, is saying some... particularly in the independent quote-unquote community mm-hmm. that this is a given that we are all right that it's, we're all going to have to be publicists already. Right. And, and distributors and we're going to have to learn how to do our little elevator spiel in one line and, and you know all of that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and it's actually to some degree there's some truth in that there's some sad truth in it because they, because we live in a country that simply doesn't support the arts, so sometimes we simply have to, uh, you know, pick up the slack because you don't have the budget for yeah. Hiring but a it, publicist but it's or... also all filmmakers are not meant to be publicists, and mm. some of them are better filmmakers because they're not good publicists, mm-hmm. and people are losing sight of that as an equation because they're putting too much attention on the publicist side. Mm. Not that there's anything wrong with publicists. We had a good one for Museum Hours, and I'm very fa- thankful that we did. But, you know, that's not what every filmmaker needs to be. So I think it's very important that people start reckoning with that a little bit more in this pressure that filmmakers feel now, especially in the independent world. A lot of that is not going to result in better films. It's just going to be resulting in more things getting in your face. And right. And right. And and these longer periods between films that the, or projects. Sure. Because you have to travel with the film and peer and. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, that's important. I don't, I'm not against traveling with the film. I'm really thankful that there, you know, at least is, some kind of circuit that encourages that because it's great to to meet the people meet the people and have Talk with see what they think you made and and all of that 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 can be 
quite wonderful. But there's a difference between that and catering your work towards maximum publicity and and sort of hitching hitching your 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 filmmaking career onto this huge machine which is all about growing then your the expectations are the budget's going to grow in the next film you're going to start adding better known faces and names right. to it in order to get more people to come to it then the next thing you know and this is what wonderful many wonderful filmmakers are are they're quite, they're swept up in this that this is how you grow as a filmmaker and it's probably true that if they do make those decisions, then they will be able to focus more on filmmaking. But you know, is it their is it still their films that they're going to be making once they're caught into this exactly you know exactly. Uh, momentum? That's not, yeah yeah. Well, this was a great conversation, but I've taken up twice as much of your time as I think you had intended. We'll we'll pick this up hopefully maybe uh, again sometime. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting me talk. Thank you for talking.